Hi, everyone, and welcome to SUNCOP. Uh, my name is Ariel Molino. Welcome to the 14th uh, SUNCOP Global Summit 2022. Mm -hmm. This session uh, that we're having today is Structuring Payment for Ecosystem Services, Harnessing the Potential of in Incentive-Based Mechanisms for Biodiversity and Water Outcomes. So thank you so much for joining this discussion. And I would like to now introduce the moderator of the session and hand it over to Shweta Bhagwat uh, with the Telecap. So Shweta, over to you. Uh, thank you, Errol. Uh, very warm welcome to everyone. And uh, so uh, today we have a session. Uh, so today's session basically is uh, we look at demystifying payment for ecosystem services for climate action in India. Uh, we'll be trying to focus more on talking about water and biodiversity outcomes. And uh, uh, we look at basic three pillars today, that is uh, the economics, the, uh, the economic aspect, the motivations, and what are the institutional aspects. So this is what we do. But and uh, to share with us their experience, we uh, uh, to share with uh, to share with us um, their insights. We have a very uh, experienced panel. Uh, we have Dr. James Brignot. Uh, he is uh, uh, the director at uh, Asset Research, uh, Restore, and he's also the uh, Restore Africa Fund Manager. Um, uh, he has extensive experience, and he he is also a professor at uh, Stellenbosch University and honorary research associate of uh, SACON. Uh, he he consults on several uh, donor projects and working as a consultant with World Bank as well. So in his uh, three decades of experience uh, uh, of working on, uh, uh, on economics of restoration, I'm sure we will have some uh, uh, excellent insights from him on the economic aspects and structuring of uh, uh, restoration projects. Uh, then we have with us is uh, uh, Dr. Rohit Jindal. Uh, he is an associate professor and chair of Department of Decision Sciences at McGovern University, uh, Canada. He has worked with University of Calgary uh, uh, School of uh, uh, School of Business and uh, the University of Alberta's Department of Resource Economics. Dr. Jindal works on the intersection of environment and development issues and their effects on businesses, nonprofits, and local communities. Uh, he has been doing some uh, very interesting work around behavioral economics. And today we are going to talk about uh, his uh, applied research findings. I'm sure uh, we'll get to learn about some uh, very, uh, uh, very good, uh, what we say, very applicable methods, how research can actually help uh, uh, the practice. So breaching that, I think uh, Dr. Jindal's experience is going to help us there today. Then we have uh, uh, with us Mr. Uh, um, uh, Mr. S.T.S. Lepcha. Uh, he is a former I IFS officer and has served as an additional principal chief conser uh, conservator of forest, uh, for, uh, forest conservation from uh, uh, 2000, uh, 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 from Uttarakhand. His previous, uh, uh, so he, he has also served as a regional manager of Uttarakhand uh, uh, Forest Development Corporation. He has enormous experience with him. Um, uh, he is a very active member. He's also a member of uh, Spring Shed Consortium in Uttarakhand, and today we'll be talking a little bit about his experience there. Uh, he's active member of several committees, including uh, Uttarakhand's Kampa Executive Committee and Steering Committee. Also, uh, he's the chairman of People's Biodiversity Register Monitoring Committee constituted by Uttarakhand Biodiversity Board, and he's an expert advisor to the Uttarakhand Bamboo and Fiber Development Board. Uh, he also he is also an editor in chief for NTFP journal published in Uttarakhand. So um, so you see uh, today we have a panel with a lot of experience of working around uh, uh, payment for ecosystem services. So issues which are uh, which are relevant from uh, you know structuring payment for ecological services. So uh, I think um, let's uh, 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 we'll just uh, start off with uh, uh, just a brief background about. Uh, like the emergence of payment of ecosystem services. So it's more than two decades now that globally uh, payment for ecosystem services has emerged as a pioneering mechanism, especially in Australia and uh, US. You are also seeing programs in uh, Europe and uh, uh, Southeast Asia. Um, there are more than uh, 550 programs around the world and more than uh, 34 to 42 billion uh, 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 you know, transactions, so uh, best transactions happen. Um, but so the ecology and economic linkage is now increasingly being established. Uh, research or, or World Bank uh, research actually says that you know uh, in Africa and South Asian countries uh, could actually uh, tackle 10% uh, of GDP losses every year, um, uh, and uh, because of failure of ecosystem services from fisheries and forestry and pollination. So restoration is has an option or is a very uh, what we say uh, uh, restoration is is being perceived as a valid option 
for uh, and presents an opportunity for uh, even economics so this establishing the, this ecology and economic linkage through payment for ecosystem services or through um, uh, or through incentive based mechanisms is what we are trying to understand and especially in case of india because the potential has been talked about a lot but uh, we should know how to structure it so today's uh, i mean I, i'll just kind of start of the session with dr james uh, wherein um, i would like to understand from him so he has enormous work of working in south africa especially on uh, uh, and uh, on on uh, payment for ecosystem services and on environmental degradation so maybe from your work highlights uh, if uh, dr james if you could tell us about uh, the uh, we know that environmental degradation arises out of institutional and uh, moral failures and uh, they and and they can be rectified using ecosystem restoration is what uh, you have been trying to tell through your work so how do you make this economics of the restoration work typically who would bear the cost of such uh, restoration uh, and also under what context or threshold does a pest program become a more preferred alternative to policy makers over the other alternatives that we have so if you could start us giving a perspective on the economics part of it i think it will be very helpful Thank you, Sweta, and thank you for the opportunity to share some ideas around payments for ecosystem services and restoration with with you and and all the participants. I think it is a very exciting topic. I think it is a very important topic and a very necessary topic to discuss at this juncture, at this point in time, especially because we're also in the UN decade of restoration at the moment. And uh, now that we are in the UN decade of restoration, the whole emphasis thereof is to go from concepts and theory and uh, basically talk to to applications and implementations for of restoration and a variety of restoration initiatives globally and then the issue of payments are obviously up there among the top items because i mean somebody needs to bear the the cost of the the restoration somebody needs to be engaged in those activities and and how is that going to be structured and what possible avenues there uh, might be there for for taking it forward and then the um, uh, the the buzzwords are then the mainstreaming thereof and the upscaling thereof and um, i would like to uh, respond to your question in in a in a, a variety of ways um in order of taking us back to to how i became involved in this and and what we are doing so you have mentioned that we've been engaged in the economics of restoration for a long time um which basically entails calculating the benefits and the costs of restoration and putting forward a business case for restoration and and at that we have published a, a variety of different papers on it and, and dedicated and showing that the benefits of restoration from an economic perspective outweighs the costs tremendously varies from a ratio of say uh 3 to 1 3 units of benefits uh we've calculated the papers that we've uh, published we've you've used dollars but but i think one can use a variety of different um denominators uh denominations there but so 3 dollars to 1 in terms of the benefits in uh, some ecosystems up to uh, even as much as 35 to 1 in in the grassland areas grasslands being very very productive the savanna areas as well but that's on an economic side um the question is when it comes to payments for ecosystem services it's a financial question uh so where is the money going uh so it's rather easy to think of it in terms of the economics of restoration um and calculate all those benefit cost ratios uh, which is necessary and, and and valuable but it doesn't really help us to actually implement it in a practical sense because for that we real real need real dollars and and not um monopoly dollars uh, if i could call it that way right okay. um and uh, and that has led us to the flip side of the economics of restoration which is actually the restoration of economics 
So if you think about it, you, you, we're working theoretically on the economics of restoration, but the reason why we've got degradation is because the economy is sick. So the economy is sick because, uh, and that has led to the degradation events in the first place. So we have to focus a lot of attention also on the restoration of economics. And it is this counterpart, so you can almost see it as the two sides of the same coin, the economics of restoration and the restoration of economics, because the two goes, has to go hand in hand if you want to actually get investment into the res restoration initiatives. So by focusing then on the, now that we know that the economics of restoration, the benefits exceeds the costs in, in most uh, cases, right. um, we have to ask the question now, how are we going to get the money into the system? And that is by the removal of the drivers of degradation and fixing those systemic errors that you have highlighted, the moral failures, the institutional failures that prevents the financial flows to actually take place. Um, and that includes mindsets, uh, technical approaches, and the manner in which how we engage with people and with nature in general. Fortunately, from a financial sense, the definition of what constitutes an asset has changed. So from an accounting sense, now an investment in restoration can actually be seen as a balance sheet item. Normally, uh, restoration activities have been seen as a cost item. And for as long as it is seen as a cost item, there's a drive to minimize expenditure. Globally, doesn't matter who you are, you would like to minimize expenditure and you would like to, ex uh, would like to make investments as big as possible. Okay. So by this definition change, whereby an investment in natural capital can be considered as an investment in an asset, it has become a game changer. Now, it's very recent, the um, International Accountancy Standards Board, the uh, institution, the board that uh, sort of writes the rules for accountancy as a subject in terms of what defines what, has made this change in, in 2017 and started to implement it in 2019. Um, right. And the implementation thereof has been sort of halted by, because of the global lockdown. But this has become a game changer in how we are approaching uh, payments for ecosystem services, answering your question, who must pay for the cost? Because now it is not really a cost minimizing exercise anymore. It has now become an investment uh, exercise, broadening the investment base, including natural capital or investment in natural capital as part of that. And so now it becomes a question of how much can we invest to broaden the base, which I think is a completely different way of looking at payments for ecosystem services, uh, because now it is a question of who would like to invest in uh, natural capital and broaden their investment portfolio, not just in financial assets or in manufactured assets, but also then in the healing of the land and, the, and through that, the healing of the people. And... Um, we are seeing changes, although it's early days, and uh, I, I, I will acknowledge that because I mean of the recent changes and now this uh, implementation thereof. But I think it's important to realize that part of the mind shift change that we have seen is this change towards how we approach um, in restoration initiatives going forward. Mm -hmm. So your last part of your question was then, um, what is the threshold sure, when yeah. a government will then uh, say, but okay, now we will like to engage in, in payments for ecosystem services. Okay. I think there are a couple of things to, to take a, a, a cognizance of. Obviously, it must be legal transactions according to the country's laws. I mean, it, it cannot be illegal transactions. I think okay. that is goes without saying, but one should just put it out there. It, it has to be within the framework of what the, the constitution and the and the law permits. Um, and then normally in payments for ecosystem services has got both public and private uh, benefits. And so what the we're trying to achieve and trying to accomplish is that the public benefits 
are being um, supported by the fiscus, by, by government, and the private contributions by the uh, by the private sector. And so Payments for Ecosystem Services has got this fantastic opportunity for, for co-financing um, in terms of the, uh, the, re the restoration activities going forward. And okay. by this co-investment, you can actually also get people to talk with one another. So sure. let me stop there. I'm very excited uh, about the, yeah. mm, the the possibilities that 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 has arisen from from these recent changes. Thank you, Sweta. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. James. Thank you so much for giving us the perspective. I think uh, it's very true that now, uh, uh, since the change wherein we now have an asset class, nature is defined as an asset class, that's actually presenting the opportunity. And also uh, post Paris Agreement and uh, you know the commitments which na uh, nations are making, I think more and more uh, uh, innovations and uh, uh, the structures can be developed around it. Uh, I, I think very um, it, it, when you're talking about mindsets and technology, Technology man, I think that's where I think probably I'll get uh, Rohit in. So Dr. Chandal, uh, probably um, he has a lot of uh, he uh, experience and uh, on uh, behavioral economic side. So maybe uh, we get Dr. Chandal's uh, um, uh, uh, you know view on uh, uh, on when we are structuring CPS contracts. There, there there are definitely generic issues that affect most of the. Uh, programs, irrespective of you know what uh, ecosystem service is being traded, but um, uh, I think we would like to have is uh, have Dr. Jindal talk a little bit about the motivations. So you have been ca carrying out these behavioral experiments on some of these issues. So can you summarize based on your work how the stakeholder motivation, especially uh, those of uh, program participants, affect uh, the success of a best program or a performance? Thank you. Um, I'm also excited to be uh, part of this panel, um, both Mr. Lepcha and uh, and Dr. James. Uh, they're pretty well known. Um, I have followed uh, James's work on uh, working for water program in South Africa. Um, you know, he's written quite quite extensively on that. Uh, another thing is uh, what I'll try to do is I'll try to summarize some of my work. But if uh, people have follow up questions, they can always uh, contact me directly. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, if any research project uh, kind of catches their attention. So, you know, we, we know that uh, PES or PES involves exchange of ecosystem services uh, in return for some kind of economic incentive between buyers and sellers. Um, now, often there are questions regarding sellers that are more important for sustainability. You know, when we talk of motivations or stakeholders, it's usually on the buyer side uh, that uh, those motivations, uh, sorry, on the seller side, uh, because on the buyer side, well, once we have the finance, as uh, James talked about, uh, then once the finance is in place, uh, you know, we can get the project going. But the, the motivations tend to um, matter more from the seller side. Um, and in developing country context, um, what tends to happen is that these sellers are often uh, rural communities you know, farmers or landholders in, in rural areas. And so it, it becomes even more important in terms of uh, what is, um, you know, what are their uh, motivations to, to come into a project. Um, so we call them, uh, so, and, and essentially, PES is all about behavioral change, you know, changing a behavioral pattern of how people use resources or how they look after resources. So we call them as second generation issues because, um, in, in the first case, you know, when PES first started out, it was more about is PES feasible? Um, how do we, you know, uh, can we raise money for it? Uh, but now I think we've moved on to the second generation where we are saying, okay, once the project is in place, how are we going to make it sustainable, especially on the seller side? And uh, I think some of the questions uh, that we are trying to address um, uh, through field research um, are, are things like, uh, you know, when you're structuring PES, um, is, is a payment is a cash payment an appropriate vehicle of incentivizing in all contexts, or is it context dependent? You know, um, okay. maybe in some cases payments may not be the best way to uh, motivate uh, this. You know, the uh, the rural communities they're already doing something which is pro social for the environment, and by mm. making payments, we probably may even uh, crowd out their in intrinsic motivation, or uh, uh, you know, um, uh, that um, it may not be sustainable in the long run. Um, the, the other is 
once we have decided uh, that payment is the correct vehicle, uh, we don't really have markets that operate for these environmental services. These are like projects that are exist, you know, that are one off projects or projects that are um, um, taking place in, in, um, in, in different areas. So how do you decide how much do you really pay? Um, yeah. And then, uh, you know, with projects located in remote areas, especially in developing countries, uh, not every activity can be monitored. Of course, we talk about MRV systems. We talk about uh, the use of uh, modern remote sensing technologies, but not, not every activity can be really monitored. So uh, then there are also behavioral questions about will people necessarily cheat if we don't look after uh, how, what they're doing? Right. So we've been carrying out research uh, to address these questions uh, using what I call as kind of ma marrying environmental economics with uh, behavioral economics in the field. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll quickly summarize um, um, a couple of studies that we've done to address the question, kind of question that I just uh, raised. Um, so, uh, so, for example, um, we did some comparative experiments across uh, Mexico and Tanzania. And in, in Mexico, uh, people were, so these uh, experiments were done in villages that were uh, not far from an urban center. So there were some issues that are, you can call them as peri-urban or kind of like uh, small townships in these mm -hmm. villages. And so um, people were asked to, um, you know, collect litter because that was a big issue in, in that area. And the different treatments that we had were, uh, in some cases, uh, people were just asked and to volunteer. In some cases, mm -hmm. people were uh, given payments um, to, to, to come and do the task. And in, in other cases, um, people were told that the payment would be actually made to the village leaders. So mm -hmm. what we found in Mexico was that uh, wherever people um, did not have a system of doing something for the group, for the village, they did respond to incentives. But if they did not trust the village leaders, then their participation actually went down when we mentioned the payment um, to, to the village leaders. Now, so, so, um, in, you know, so, so for example, in Mexico, uh, the payment turned out to be a correct vehicle in villages where there was no background of people coming together. But on the other hand, when we did similar experiments in Tanzania, where... Uh, there is a history of people uh, coming together and doing something uh, to look after their common forests or natural or forest in the vicinity. What we found was that, um, in fact, when payments were introduced or mentioned, people's motivations went down because they felt as if uh, you know that they their work was being uh, capitalized, and so. In, in cases where the payments were mentioned, that's when they expected higher payments, even the payments that, uh, that, uh, that were being given to them. On the other hand, when, when no payments were mentioned, the participation rates were exceedingly high. And when we asked them, why were people participating? They said, well, this is something for, for our community. So, so when we contrasted the experiments, what we found was that it's not that payments are not useful, but we have to see the context in which they'll be useful. So in, in Mexico, the payments were useful, they were effective, but not in Tanzania. The other important uh, finding from these experiments was that often in PEST projects, um, the, the implementing agency tends to provide very trivial, almost like a, like a token money and yeah. call, call it as payment. So what we found was that either you pay enough or you don't pay at all. Don't make those trivial payments because those really crowd out uh, people's uh, intrinsic motivation. Uh, the other study um, is in Vietnam where we were trying to find out what happens if you don't really monitor people's uh, activities. And this was done in uh, northern Vietnam uh, rural areas where people have high levels of trust, uh, um, very, very close um, uh, social groupings. And we found that whether uh, it was cash or in-kind or people working out in groups or individuals, people did not cheat. They just did not cheat. And uh, once we created that trust, you know, um, there was uh, be people had high ownership of what was happening. Now, when we replicated similar experiments, not exactly the same experiments because uh, it was difficult, but similar experiments in Hanoi, which is the capital, uh, results were different. Uh, in those in Hanoi, we found people to be cheating. Uh, okay. So, so there yeah. we had. So, the result was that yes, you have to monitor uh, what people are doing. So, I guess um, uh, these are some of the studies, and the way they help to structure PES is um, is that 
we we need to identify uh, is payment an appropriate vehicle, and how do you structure the payment? Because if you are structuring the payment, then it has to be enough. It has otherwise don't make trivial payments because then you're sure. trivializing the effort. And then right. when it comes to monitoring, if we build a uh, strong trust, then maybe we don't need to have so much uh, effort put into monitoring every single activity that people are doing. Because at the end of the day, uh, if you are having a long term project, you are not going to be able to monitor every single thing. Sure. Right. Uh, Dr. Jindal, this is so wonderful because I think the cases that you have shared, I mean, this is the kind of research which is actually helpful uh, in structuring uh, the initiatives. And I think uh, um, I, I'll, from here, I'll uh, go to uh, uh, Mr. Lepcha, who himself is in the, uh, you know, uh, in the process of uh, devising a very unique, uh, uh, what we say, a unique mechanism in Uttarakhand. And uh, uh, we'll hear a little bit more. But what I want to hear from, so we now from motivations, I think we'll try and understand the institutional aspect. Uh, so, uh, like you have spoken about, uh, Dr. Jindal, you pointed out about, uh, you know, uh, having uh, so, uh, places wherein the social uh, capital is more or trust is more, uh, the, the structuring was different. So, institutions actually have a institutional uh, institutions to offer uh, a very different perspective on structuring the organization so maybe we will uh, i will uh, go to Dr. Uh, mr lepcha now who has been uh, you know part of government uh, uh, framework for uh, many years now and he has immense experience of working on developmental programs he has also worked on many initiatives wherein he's got communities involved so i think he gets perspective of both uh, uh, you know both sides and uh, uh, he is also aware about you know uh, how uh, siloed approach uh, 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 you know uh, uh, usually the government programs use a siloed approach and that kind of limits uh, um, uh, 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 the potential or the impact potential that can be achieved. So maybe, uh, Mr. Lepcha, based on your experience, if you could enlighten us with the role of uh, that institutionalization can play, uh, especially when we are structuring uh, incentive-based uh, mechanisms. Uh, this is more in context of India and your experience. Maybe if you can talk about how uh, does institutionalization enable an incentive mechanism? Yeah. Thank you, Sweta. Yeah. Uh, I I will concentrate more, more only, uh, only on the spring set management uh, done in the uh, right. state of Uttarakhand. Right. So uh, as you know that uh, springs are dying, and uh, in the mountain area, almost uh, ninety four percent of the springs uh, uh, drinking water uh, uh, communities are uh, uh, depend upon the uh, springs. Almost ninety four percent. So so it's a huge. Right. So, because of climate change and all this uh, degradation of forest, so there they are uh, problems are there. True. So, uh, uh, in this regard, the new uh, technology, the geo hydrology uh, method for spring uh, revival, was started uh, in Uttarakhand by some NGOs, PSI and uh, Himothan, Chira. Yes. Yeah. So that was the uh, geo hydrological method in two thousand nine. So uh, during that time, the, uh, we have seen the result working in the field. So they have uh, recharged almost 2,000 springs, which are right. drying up. So the, the uh, recharge was increased by double, uh, triple, some cases triple also. So, but in NGO sector, uh, they have a, uh, uh, the pattern of working is different. Right. But in the but in the government system, as you say, we work always in the silo. So during 2018, the, uh, the resource uh, book on uh, spring says management was published by planning uh, uh, Niti Aayog. Right. So yeah. after publishing that, that book, only the government uh, people are getting to know that. So the spring is also very important, uh, how to go about it. So um, in Uttarakhand Forest Department, the PCCF, uh, uh, the D then PCCF was Mr. Jairaj. So he uh, formed the consortium of uh, different uh, departments. For example, the key department was uh, drinking water, irrigation, then some research institute, uh, some university, NGOs. Right. So it, it was a loose uh, uh, 
kind of consortium. So in first phase, what uh, we did, uh, I was the member of consortium. So right. uh, uh, the problem of drinking water was there in the village and that uh, pipeline was managed by irrigation department, sorry, uh, drinking uh, PHE department. Right. So they have supplied the data to the forest department. Most of the springs, almost 99% of the springs, they are in the reserve forest. But because of uh, Conservation Act, the other department cannot work inside the reserve forest. That reserve was forest. the problem. That was right. the problem. So what uh, the forest department uh, did, that getting that data and the, the, uh, they uh, started uh, recharging the springs less than 50%. Those uh, springs are dying less than 50%. So initially, the data was supplied by the uh, irrigation uh, drinking water department. The forest department has done recharging a spring, but the geohydrological survey was done by the uh, yeah. NGOs. The, that that uh, knowledge was not with, with uh, the government system. So right. likewise, the first phase was more of a top-down method. But uh, gradually, uh, we have uh, for the sustainability of any springs. Any any program, we need uh, community to be involved. Correct. So in the second phase, uh, in Uttarakhand, we have a unique uh, system of community uh, forest. So we have a one panchayats. Right. So it was around 12,000 12, one panchayats. So right. the second round, uh, we have involved those one panchayat and we have mm -hmm. separate uh, principal chief conservator of uh, forest uh, looking after one panchayats. Right. So, uh, so now we are identifying, uh, we have already identified the Ban Panchayat and uh, the implementation work will start with the uh, Ban Panchayats in this area. And it, it, it is uh, uh, actually, uh, this is very new technology for communities also. Geoideology, right. we have to train them. So, so there is still gap. We are just evolving. evolving. And mm. uh, we have seen some of the springs. Uh, work done by uh, NGOs in some of the area, uh, the uh, the chill pine, the pine, pine generally grows in the dry, dry area, right. is dying because the community has uh, uh, conserved those area uh, with this uh, geohydrological method and the oaks are coming up. So that means oaks coming means the soil moisture is increased mm -hmm. and the Pine is dying. That means the, it is a very good indicator for the moisture is increasing. So that means the community is jealously protecting that area from forest fire, from grazing, and they are getting directly benefit uh, because they got uh, water two or three times, and they right. not for, only for drinking. Right. Now they are uh, growing off-season vegetable, and they they are selling to uh, the tourists. Right. So, so, Sweta, I will stop here. Here, then yeah. on second session, I will, I will uh, go for a PES. How we what we are thinking to go. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, uh, that that is hypothesis only. Right, <laughs> but right, I think right. it, it it will work. Yes. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lefcha, for sharing this with us, because, you know, this is building this context actually helps us uh, 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 in kind of understanding that how uh, you know, when we look at PES, it's always about uh, cross-sectoral linkages are extremely important. And probably uh, what uh, Mr. Lepcha's experience is actually telling about is it was only like you have different departments coming in. But when there is an institutional body here, uh, though the institution is, uh, you know, uh, uh, formally, uh, it's uh, it, it was initially a loose uh, collaboration uh, of uh, people coming together or of institutions coming together. But that too kind of helps uh, setting the initial context in. So maybe uh, uh, we do, uh, I mean, that kind of brings out the role of uh, when you have an institution which can play an anchor role and uh, talk to different, uh, you know, uh, uh, to different institutions who are also involved in managing their own uh, different areas then that kind of helps set the con. I think this is especially true in country like India, wherein 
convergence is something which is which is which we are doing now through programs but yet when we think about something like this case where in which kind of presents a very potential case for uh, payment for ecosystem services i think uh, uh, mr lepcha is going to talk about it in the second half but uh, this is where i think uh, i will uh, uh, J uh, dr james i'll probably get you in here we we, we, are, we are now kind of understand the important of uh, the importance of uh, uh institutions but maybe uh, you could uh, also tell us a little bit about uh, you know highlight something from uh, from uh, from examples uh, or from your work uh, if you know what are the key success factors you know uh, uh, for uh, making the program support uh, you know making sustainable the pro uh, uh, making such program sustainable uh, beyond the program support so if you could talk a little bit about that and also give us out some examples in your uh, this thing about how uh, societal healing you you spoke about societal healing so maybe you could showcase how societal healing is actually an outcome of uh, uh, could be an outcome of uh, good practices in uh, incentive kind uh, like pest kind of programs i think uh, that will be quite helpful for us thank you sweta and thank you for colleagues yes i think uh, what we have heard this morning this far is that context is very important context matters there is no magic bullet no uh, one size fits all solution no, no. it no. has to be applicable to the specific context and um and that context is defined by um, obviously by the legal environment but it's also defined by the the community or the society as well as the individual ecosystem or ecosystem service that's applicable and so we see all these different layers and therefore one will must be cautious uh, caution against to say but what would be the magic uh, solution here i'm going to share four examples and i'll try to be very quick to show how how different mechanisms have been applied in the different contexts um all under the broad umbrella of payments for ecosystem services um noting also that one uh, can have a very strict definition there of or then a very broad definition there of and i prefer the broad definition so that we cannot so that we don't be pedantic about definitions and rhetoric um but that we can actually see how we can advance the thing that you've highlighted in terms of societal healing um from a variety of different perspectives so within a conservation in, uh, environment it plays um Uh, it places a very interesting role because conservation um does uh, various different things obviously there needs to be a payment for the specific service in terms of the labor and the and the facilities but then there is the value of the amenity services the enjoyment of the nature but then also the water and the carbon and the nutrient cycles that comes from it so what we see is in the field of conservation is that there's a premium to go to a a, a lodge or a facility um in a conservation area above say a bed and breakfast or a hotel that is not um because you still have to manage this entire environment um and the management of the entire context and how do you pay for this um environmental services the way to do that is through a premium in terms of when you go to a lodge or you go to a specific camping site or into a conservation area and so that is a way how you then can recoup um some of nature's services in order to manage those services uh to 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 uh, yeah to society as well so there's one uh, very sp uh, specific application of it within conservation within restoration and uh, dr ruet has referred to the work the uh, working for water program um which you can uh, there are uh, multiple different ways of how it is being funded the one is a, a, a public sector uh, uh, purely a, pub, a public sector investment from the fiscus but then there are uh, also other ways of paying for it whereby water utilities making a contribution from water levies the to co-finance it there are um uh, ways whereby uh farmers uh, are making contributions to it so co-financing is fire farmers making uh, and therefore the people who support direct water 
um, beneficiaries receiving the water services are making contributions to the clearing of invasive aliens, restoration, etc., making co-payments. Um, and then there are the ways whereby NGOs um, and uh, civil society as well as uh, conservation agencies are making contributions, co-contributions to it. So the variety of different ways how the restoration activities are being funded with uh, the, uh, the public sector being what we call the anchor tenant. When you put up a mall, uh, a big mall or shopping mall, you're, you're looking for the anchor tenant. Who will be the big anchor tenant, the big uh, occupier of space? But then you've got all these small little vendors around it. Nice. And it's actually the vendors that are bringing all the feet and bringing the ambience uh, and the enjoyment and everything. But you need the anchor tenant uh, to act as the co uh, as the main host. And within this context, yeah, the government is playing that anchor tenant, but then it's the vendors around it, the water utilities, the farmers, the NGOs, the communities that provides us with a beehive of activity, if I could use that phrase completely out of context. Mm -hmm. um, so the second, a third example, so that was on the work, work, Working for Water uh, program, which has got more than just water in mind, but also biodiversity as well as uh, carbon sequestration, etc. The third one then is where I would like to spend a little bit more focus on and attention on, and that is, I think, something that is very close to everybody's heart, and that is agriculture. So what we have seen is that, um, and I think that's a global phenomenon, is that agriculture is occupying um, uh, by far the biggest land space, by far the biggest land user. And mm. that is also where most of the tra land transformation is taking place. Okay. So one can focus on areas that's pristine and areas that's an urban areas for restoration payments for ecosystem services, but and and try to um, make them as best as, as good as possible. But that's only a very small fraction of the land area. If we can get even small improvements in the agricultural area because of the sheer quantum of hectares that's applied, you mm. can actually have a huge impact, mm. and that is where um, communities farmers and, and, and people living in cities, uh, the utilizers of the ecosystem services, which is food, one often forget that food is a provisioning service, it's an ecosystem service, mm. you, you, you buy the food, that's an ecosystem service, and you pay for that ecosystem service already, um, that you can actually, through conservation and regenerative agriculture, actually achieve a lot. So we've worked in the last couple of years uh, on a variety of different mechanisms, how we can actually try to engage uh, communities and as well as uh, smallholder farmers, as well as commercial farmers in adopting um, conservation and regenerative agriculture practices. Those practices are restorative by nature because it is about cover crops, crop, crop rotation, uh, improvement of the nutrient cycle, improvement of the hydrologic, uh, hydrological cycle, etc. And for that, it needs people to assist the farmers in making the transition from conventional deep tillage, uh, chemical warfare type agriculture over to much more wholesome forms of agriculture. And we have seen a lot of interest and a big uptake in this uh, because everybody is very sensitive around food and the food system and the quality of food. And that has become a very in, uh, important focus because now there's uh, in terms of restoration, the restoration initiative, and it makes it actually quite easy to develop uh, payments for ecosystem services or type of payments for ecosystem services around something that everybody wants and everybody needs and that has got a huge footprint. Um, and with direct benefits to the farmers, the land managers, land custodians, land uh, owners, and the, and the beneficiaries of that services, yeah. the, the, the food. Um, but then also then the um, additional benefits that we're getting in terms of improved biodiversity, improved nutrients, reduction in um, uh, effluent, 
and as well as the soil carbon sequestration. So a variety of different ways how you then can cut it, but, but let me then uh, stop there. Yeah, Dr. Jim, sorry to uh, like, you know, interrupt you there, but uh, probably I'm also keeping a time on the tab that we have. And uh, so I, I'll just uh, probably go to uh, uh, Mr. Lepcha now to, so that, you know, uh, we were, uh, I mean, uh, I do understand you're, you're talking about, you know, uh, the the importance of looking at farmers or, uh, you know, the community, the, the land use. So uh, I think here, uh, uh, maybe uh, we'll, we'll, we'll touch back upon this. Well, I'll go to uh, Dr. Lepcha now, uh, wherein uh, he could probably tell us about, uh, you know, how to anchor like uh, the, the, the potential of Uttarakhand case study that we were talking about. I think you can just talk about, uh, t tell us a little bit more about how can that uh, structure, how does he envision like, you know, uh, a structure uh, of uh, payment and ecosystem services, how it can uh, uh, be, uh, you know, uh, looked into structured and all, uh, or institutionalized as well. And also, what could be the potential role of private sector player? Because it's, it, it actually presents a very uh, a good case there. So, uh, uh, Mr. Lepcha, over to you. Uh, uh, the, the, what we are proposing in the second phase is that uh, there should be a four-tier uh, system in the uh, institution system. One is at the secretariat government level, so uh, then uh, at the uh, department level, then right. at district level, then at uh, uh, village level. So, okay. so we, we have to involve uh, secretary level because they will issue the government order. So if government order is issued, then uh, maybe uh, some officers may be retired or not. They, they follow the government system path. You know? So uh, regarding uh, the, uh, uh, the Palomi Mozumdar also uh, asked the question about the why in India this PS is not ready. So especially in water, th there is an example in Palampur, in Himachal uh, um, Pradesh. Yeah. Uh, in India, what uh, my experience is that there is no uh, uh, basic baseline data and there is no policy and legislation. Right. So th that is the uh, major factor. What we are thinking is that uh, in, in case of water, uh, suppose uh, the one springs is uh, giving around 10 liters. So we, we can do baseline. Then after intervention, suppose it is giving 20 liters. So that right. means... So 10 liters is increased. So right. the villagers may use 15 uh, liter right. for their uh, themselves and the 5 liter maybe goes to the Ganga water system. So we have a data. For those data, there are lots of so, so many apps are there. It can be recorded in the small mo mobile app. So yes. everybody has data. So that can be uh, put into the server and it, 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 may, it can be mon uh, monitorized. I think in Andhra Pradesh or Ma Maharashtra, they have already done that. So, yeah. suppose, uh, see, uh, uh, 12,000 uh, Banpanchas did uh, uh, such type of work. This is a hypothetical. Yeah. So, there are 12,000 voices are there. So, we can, uh. we can put pressure on the government Say, we are releasing this much of water to Ganga watershed. Please pay us uh, this much. So, but in any case, uh, in Uttarakhand, uh, because of uh, near to Delhi and all, so we are lots of tourists and there are uh, tourist tourism hubs are increasing. Mm -hmm. So, I have seen in the month of summer when the uh, floating uh, population is very high, the people, the individual people are uh, selling water to the hotelier directly. Mm -hmm. So that means needs are there. So we can uh, 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 develop a data where we, we can marketing can be done directly to this type of work. Mm -hmm. Maybe right. maybe uh, this uh, model can be uh, can, cannot be done at the remote area, but at right. least at the suburb area, some like. eco tourism area, satellite area, this. This model can can be immediate. That this is the immediate immediate benefit without involving uh, the government. Because right. in the uh, suppose uh, uh, if you involve uh, panchayats and panchayats uh, uh, they have a, a, a um, panchayat forest are there. It is a community forest. As right. per the act, uh, the water is 
non-timber forest produce. So they have a hundred percent right. So they can sell those water directly to hoteliers or expatriate. So they can right. earn money and uh, th- they can use those money for the for the restoration of the uh, forest area. For example, right. uh, the PCCF of uh, Uttarakhand has already uh, kept forty crores of rupees for spring development of uh, uh, in Uttarakhand. Yeah. So it is a huge. Uh, the government has a capital money, but right. there is no recurring uh, uh, money. So this uh, this type of money can be recycled, but we right. have to involve community from the early stage. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So uh, I I think it, it's very helpful for us to kind of. understand uh, uh, from you that you know how potential a potential pest mechanism how uh, i mean in case of india in context of india and i think uh, spring shed program is something which has uh, which is uh, taken up a lot like uh, even government like you said is investing a lot in the hilly areas in in himalayan belt it's investing a lot uh, uh, in spring shed development so and it actually presents an opportunity for developing an incentive based mechanism now uh, i think we are uh, uh, we have around 10 minutes left in the session and uh, we have received some questions from the audience and we'll take them up now uh, dr rohit i will with this and uh, uh, there is one question i think which ties in very well at this point in time so uh, we have tanvi asking if uh, you know uh, she's curious to know whether uh, if communities that have been historically working together could also view payments as an enabler for long term sustainable change so communities who i'll just repeat communities that have been historically working together could also view payments as an enabler for long term sustainable change now this i i'll tie this thing up to the context which uh, uh, mr lepcha just presented about one panchayats so if if, if you know if we ha- we know one panchayats as an institution which has been working together for uh, saving uh, uh, you know for conserving of forest area so do you think uh, and probably we take tanvi's question in that context so do you think that payments which uh, uh, the, we just discussed about how a uh, incentive based mechanism can be developed and how communities could be paid for the maintenance aspect of it so do you think uh, you know uh, how these two things like uh, how do you kind of gel these two things together okay thanks um yeah that's that's a, that's a very interesting question and i think this is um, part um, some of it is being addressed uh, in in research questions uh, or in research studies um, um uh, that i know i've been taking up um so you know the the general answer is uh, yes and no right because it will like uh, how james was saying it it is very context uh, specific. specific and uh, there is not uh, one shoe fits all kind of a situation now the the problem is uh, there are there are a couple of things uh, maybe i would say there are three issues involved here one is that when you are talking about communities coming together and 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 uh, and make um, and you know um, let's say strengthening social capital an external project or an external payment cannot replicate or cannot substitute the amount of effort that goes into building social capital so you cannot shortcut that process of bringing a community together by introducing external payments so okay. um, we have actually written a paper on that where we say that um, it sh- um, if you look at uh, world over just introducing external payments is not going to shortcut uh, the process that is needed to bring a community together to bring to to kind of sus- you know bring up those social norms the right. second thing is the second thing is that if let's say if a community is doing something which is pro social for the environment and then mm-hmm. we br- we bring in external payments mm-hmm. um there 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 are concerns that those payments can actually um in some cases become an enabling uh, vehicle but in other cases may even may may not be um enablers and actually could crowd out the motivation that the community feels towards environment Uh, so some some geographers have even written about you know effective ecology and saying that you know for example in orissa there are examples of people uh, community coming together and doing something uh, you know uh, saving their forest and if you okay. just come in and start paying these people uh, right. it may not be the best way of incentivizing them and the third thing is what happens when you eventually have to withdraw payments uh, right. are you uh, because introducing payments is easy but what happens when you eventually withdraw payments or at some stage 
uh, what is yeah. going so so we've been so um as far as i know um there's been only one uh field study in tibet uh mm -hmm. where um you know uh, one of my old collaborators uh, john kerr and his group they've been looking at uh, um the you know the tibetan buddhists who are very mm -hmm. pro social and pro environment and they did some study on what happens when you introduce payments and take them away um yeah. and and i've been trying to do a similar study in western rajasthan where um you know the bishnoi people are known yeah. for uh you know saving the environment and saving the wildlife in the area so i've okay. done a bunch of experiments i'm still in the middle of those experiments where we see we're trying to understand uh what happens when you introduce payments in a case where the community is already there the community is already pro social and the community is already pro environment and then you come in as an external project and bring in the money and then you take it away after some time so this is like a longitudinal pro longitudinal study and it's very complicated you know Thank it's you. very dynamic um Thank and I, and i think um, we we need to be cautious um True. Uh, about many of these interventions so so that's i think um yeah that's uh, i'm a researcher more than a project implementer so okay. my answers are always conditional on <laughs> how my research is <laughs> addressing that <laughs> no but i think that is exactly like uh, the applied nature of the research actually helps in structuring so i'm sure that when uh, we think about now even in the uttarakhand case if i put your findings on to uttarakhand case it gives us understanding of what should be looked into before offering the one panchayat there uh an incentive uh we also i think we have very uh, we have just four or five minutes left so uh, there's one question i think we'll just take it up this is for dr james uh, uh here uh, the question is on uh, so sorry just a minute. yeah just just a minute uh yeah so the question is regarding the costs uh, ratio that we were talking uh, i i think you initially mentioned uh, that three is to one cost ratio so the question is whether it includes monitoring and transaction cost uh, because often uh, i mean uh, shriji says that often uh, uh, in the work we you see that monitoring and transaction cost are really high and they uh, often deter pes schemes so yeah dr james if you could just talk about yeah. that thank and you very much I uh, would just like to support uh, what Dr. Rohit has said there, that uh, money is also the root of all evil, and we should not forget that. Uh, and if you bring that into a context, uh, into a context where you have a society that is not um, working together, where the social fiber is not strong, then you can actually create a lot of um, trouble, uh, even more bigger trouble. So. Um, and also what we have seen in the working for water program is that if you have disruptions in the payments it can actually uh, cause greater damage than 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 good coming to your specific question is then around the the management the maintenance the monitoring costs um in the work that we have done and the papers that we have published uh, and we can actually share some of those links to those papers we we have in included um, a management component and an administrative component now the studies that we've done um, looks at about 2000 case studies from around the world looking at the costs of restoration and about 200 studies on the benefits of restoration it was done for the tip assessment the economics and the environment the biodiversity assessment uh, some 10 years ago which we have then subsequently updated so there's a very strong uh, management and maintenance component that is in for the uh, duration of the study so the short answer is yes we've made provision for those costs for um, looking at those 2000 studies from around the globe who has documented the costs of and management of of restoration both the upfront costs and then the management maintenance costs there I think you're muted Shweta. You're mute Shweta. Yeah. Oh, th uh, thank you so much for that and we we do have some more uh, qu questions but the time unfortunately the time you know we are just at the end of the time I'll just uh, say thank you and uh, a few questions probably the audience can uh, you know uh, we will uh, set it out uh, we'll set out the questions uh, send it to you and maybe we can 
uh, you know, uh, like you, yeah, like you mentioned, uh, we can share with the audience as well uh, some of the links that you share with us. So we will be doing that. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for your time and uh, for giving us such uh, good insights on how to structure, uh, uh, you know, uh, the payment for ecosystem services. At the end of it, uh, I, just to summarize, I feel uh, like like Dr. James pointed out that one of the uh, the success factors or or one of the uh, potential, uh, you know. Uh, the, one of the potential change that has happened is understanding the uh, is probably uh, understanding capital uh, or nature as a uh, capital asset. So I think that's where uh, the opportunity lies, and that has kind of opened up uh, different opportunities. Though, uh, and I think the panel does agree that uh, the context uh, uh, and the vehicle of what that incentive should be is very context specific. So, uh, but nevertheless, uh, like uh, since. It uh, since now nature is uh, kind of you know uh, um, uh, uh, there are possibilities of investing in nature that the possibility has opened up. So I'm sure that uh, uh, with today's discussion, uh, the audience also kind of gets a hang of what to look for when you're structuring or what how to look at institutions. How can institutions play that role? How to you know look at restoration? Uh, uh, the the the, uh, the the how to look at the economics of restoration? How to look at it from investing angle? So when you are thinking about uh, the structuring best to look at it from the investment perspective and talk that language. Similarly, I think behavior, I think, is probably the motivations. That's very, very important when you do the structuring. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you once again for taking time out uh, uh, on this panel and, uh, uh, and sharing your insights. Thanks a lot.